yeah, uh, just, you know, like quick intro and agenda for uh, today, uh, today presentation. Uh, so uh, basically um, my experience with the streaming project was coming to the company that was establishing new smart data platform and doing something like from zero, building something from zero. We've been actually uh, putting in place first streaming pipelines for the company. So there were, you know, um, obviously some problems some uh, things we didn't know we wish we have known uh, earlier in the process to avoid some uh, some surprises uh, you know maybe if some of you have like already um, experience in the streaming project, you may find maybe some of these points like uh, um, not super surprising and you may say, okay, you should have known that. But the way I wanted to structure the presentation is actually to uh, give you this like real project experience and our like uh, real, real use case that uh, we can We've been people without previous uh, experience in streaming. We learned some stuff by doing, and now uh, now I'm sharing. And I'm I'm dividing actually this presentation into three like logical parts. One, the first, the introduction will be like about general things and some misunderstanding, confusion, people using the uh, same terminology with different meanings in mind. And I think it's, uh, you know, it's theoretical, but it, it's with the practical conclusion. So for those of you who don't like, you know, uh, going into the definition and theoretical divagations, please bear with me through this, uh, this uh, part. I think it's still pretty important. And then we'll move to like purely technical uh, stuff. And the purely technical things, there are not like uh, technology independent. So the experience I will share here is about the Databricks on AWS and about Spark uh, in general in the closing, uh, closing part, closing comments. So uh, we'll go through this terminology confusion encountered in our project between uh, deaf people, business people, also all between the deaf people speaking to each other. Uh, and then we'll move to this data breaks on AWS surprises, what surprised us when it comes to the cost breakdown, what surprised when it clustered out run a single cluster, which is actually possible on Databricks, uh, but we will discuss, uh, is it like the best approach, pros and cons. Uh, and uh, finally, um, with the Spark, you know that you can uh, use basically Python API, Scala API, uh, SQL to express your, your logic and business transformation. So I will tell you from the perspective of the stream processing, what we learned actually, is there a difference? What's the difference? Is it like all the same uh, whether, uh, we used PySpark, we used Python, so, um, I will discuss the limitation of Python here. Okay, so just moving to the first uh, part, or oh, maybe uh, ju just as a, as a note also, my assumption is that in, in the audience, we may have some people that have already some streaming experience, but we may have participants without streaming experience. So I will also like uh, review some basic theory. Uh, I will tell you like uh, introduction on the streaming sources and things, stateless and stateful operations and micro batching versus continuous processing just so that we are all on the on the same page and uh, as kind of the disclaimer you know this uh, are like my real project experiences is not necessarily like the least of the most important things to watch out during the streaming projects because there is obviously more considerations and more things to keep in mind and uh, this is just a subset i would say this is just uh, like some cherry picking of the examples what i found interesting and surprising 
Uh, okay, so uh, starting, uh, you know, uh, we'll start with this like little bit theoretical part. So what do we really mean speaking like real time, near real time, low latency? What, what does it mean? What's, what's the meaning behind these uh, terms? And uh, when, you know, when business analysts come to me and says, okay, business needs this data real time. I think that every one of us will have some uh, like uh, number in mind. Okay, like uh, real time. So I think it's like something around 20 milliseconds latency. It can vary uh, our, our you know, estimations, but probably most people will agree that uh, once every 15 minutes, it's already not a real time and the, uh, the uh, border the distinction between real time and new real time will is something that we will uh, we will uh, tell more about uh, okay so if i like google it okay what, what is real time what is new real time uh, actually one of the first google search that pop-ups is stack overflow the question someone has asked like uh, 10 years ago already so maybe with uh, you know uh, uh, already quite old answers and old question but still popping up at the very top of the google search results and you can get like you know some i, I would say uh, quite sophisticated definitions here this is highest voted answer that real time means that the time of the activities complete is part of its functional correctness and a new real time uh, system is one which uh, activities completion time responsiveness or perceived la latency when measured against wall clock time uh, are important aspects of uh, uh, system quality so one is like the um, involved in the correctness and another is important aspect uh, if we ask wikipedia for the real time computing we can even get some numbers in the uh, wikipedia entry like saying like real time responses are often understood to be in the order of milliseconds and sometimes microseconds the delay in near real time is typically in range of one to ten seconds uh, and uh, you know someone may ask uh, and why not uh, three to fifteen or three to twenty uh, how how do you come up with uh, such exact numbers but this is like uh, relating to the intuitions we all have so um uh, every like mo most of us would probably agree that 10 seconds it's can something we can uh, describe as near real time probably 25 minutes it's not uh, if one minute is uh, that, that's where we can have a discussion and another uh, wikipedia definition real time system uh, has been described as one which controls an environment by receiving data, processing them and returning the result sufficiently quickly to affect the environment at the time. So very nice definition, but what if once every 10 minutes is like sufficiently, uh, you know, quickly to affect the environment. So, uh, you know, various definitions, I'm not arguing that, that any is uh, wrong, but, you know, we use various terms uh, in here latency, like in, in our domain, we all use the latency. And here is the quotation from the book I, I, I like, by the way, and I recommend to the people who are looking like for some theoretical foundation to the uh, data engineering summed up. This is a very nice book, Designing Data Intensive Applications. And in there, they make a distinction uh, between latency and response time, saying that they are all often used simul like a synonymous, but they are not the same. The response time being what we usually probably uh, discuss as a latency uh, besides the actual time of process the requests the service time it includes network delays queuing delays latency is the duration of the request uh, is waiting to be handled so during which it is latent waiting service and uh, i'm absolutely not uh, coming here you know to tell you oh you you have got your uh, definition uh, of uh, 
latency uh, wrong. I've got some comment that someone was reading this, uh, Yuri was reading this book today. So yeah, I, I, I definitely like this book and I think it's kind of unique. And uh, in, in, in here I give example that they have kind of uh, give sometimes the strange, uh, can give in this case strange definition, but the whole book is absolutely not like that and very practical, very nice. But what I'm, what I'm trying to say uh, is that uh, in your project, um, you will have basically uh, people coming from the different backgrounds, different, uh, you know, experiences. In, in data engineering, we usually, um, we, we will be interested in what we are describing as end-to-end -end latency. And end-to-end -end latency, we can consider like, for example, only in Kafka, end-to-end -end latency in Kafka, only in Spark uh, as end-to-end -end latency in Spark. Uh, and uh, in from the business perspective, uh, this is um, like um, not very meaningful because if you come back to the business stakeholder and tell them, okay, I'm a Spark developer, I can give you 200 milliseconds latency in Spark, it says nothing to the business stakeholder. They will be interested in end-to-end -end latency of the entire pipeline. Uh, so if we have Kafka, then Spark, then some additional system consuming, uh, then we can like expand what is shown in this picture. There are many elements, but let's let's look uh, closer into that. Um, just just you know to have this this like consistent definition of and to end latency for data engineer. So uh, in here we have defined as uh, the, it includes everyone from the produce, publish, commit, catch up, fetch. So, you know, you have uh, producing the uh, data message. You have the replication between the Kafka brokers in the middle of of this uh, picture when the, uh, the same uh, message is replicated. Uh, then uh, you have the fetching time of the request uh, for the consumer. And it's all that we are interested in, in end-to-end -end latency. And um, basically, um, uh, in, in Spark Structured Streaming, uh, just to give you some numbers, we have two processing modes. Uh, we can, uh, we can, uh, we, we will actually speak a little bit more about this processing modes. So end-to-end uh, -end latency in Spark Structured Streaming, you can do it in the micro batching mode and that, that that doesn't mean like doing batch jobs in spark that means basically processing mode for the spark structured streaming you can achieve latencies like 100 milliseconds um, uh, in kafka you can easily get light and latencies below that so uh, when we sum it up it's still like well below one second uh, and if you uh, if you have like use case business scenario where you will need like extra low latencies, you may be uh, interested in uh, doing it in maybe maybe even not in Spark, but if in in uh, Spark, then uh, in this continuous processing mode, which they still describe in the, the documentation as experimental streaming execution mode, which. Um, although it has been introduced in 2.3 and we have already 3.1 uh, and it enables uh, according to, to the documentation latencies as low as one millisecond and to end latency when uh, considering Spark in our data pipeline. And, uh, you know, as, as a just disclaimer, you know, if you will be like in the scenario that you really need to care about really low latencies and um, especially in that scenario uh, where it's not like the same, uh, is it like milliseconds or is it three seconds, then it's uh, especially important to like take a look in, in terms of the percentiles and you can say like, you can look at the distribution and say that P99 uh, value was below like, uh, I don't know, uh, 500 milliseconds latencies end to end. But in the case I will be discussing today, we actually didn't need to care for the super low uh, latencies. So uh, 
this is uh, actually the the mm, like first lesson learned for me, and this is why I was uh, walking you through this like conflicting definitions. That actually there are no uh, like universally accepted definition for terms like real time, near real time, low latency, and uh, you 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 can argue that uh, you know the like good definition and this is the one that should be used. But the practice in your project that you will have colleagues coming from like different companies, different professional backgrounds. Some of us were starting more like in data warehousing, SQL world. Some of us were starting more in like uh, Java backend development. Uh, and people can be used to a little bit different terminology in different domains. So it's super important to make sure that everyone in your project is on the same page. And it's not only like for the business people because you can maybe laugh at the business people that, uh, okay, they told me they need real time but they had this batch job processed once a day. Then I told them that I will do it once every 15 minutes and then it's real time enough for them. So yeah, it can be it can be good to establish first with business. What does it mean real time? For for them maybe once half an hour is real time for some business stakeholder but even within like you know technical team you will have people like uh, using this terminology uh, and everyone can mean different things. So I've got uh, like in my experience, senior technical person, technical stakeholder was constantly referring to micro batching as just, you know, uh, approach of scheduling batch jobs to, to uh, to get something done. And uh, also the new real time was some, sometimes referred to as someone meant that, okay, we'll just uh, schedule like traditional batch processing that is running frequently. And then we needed to like dig deep each time someone used the term like, okay, so let's don't do it in real time, let's do it in new real time. Uh, then, then uh, you know, what did it mean? Or like uh, my, my colleague in the current project just recently uh, mentioned that uh, the, the thing they are implementing is uh, not real time, it's new real time because it's not continuous processing, it's micro batching. And it's like perfectly correct uh, like definition, but just to bear in mind that in the project team, everyone can think the different meaning behind, behind this uh, consideration. Okay, let me look into the chat, uh, what we have uh, link to the uh, book. Thanks guys for sharing that. Um, okay. And uh, as uh, continuing, as I promised that we will uh, do like short intro from the theoretical concepts to make sure that people that are not like doing streaming uh, or, or are not like super into the subject uh, that we are all on the same page. Uh, so uh, basically um, in the Spark, it's it has been abstracted with the Spark structured streaming to the table like abstractions. So you can really write SQL logic on your uh, streaming jobs that may be not the, the best way to do it from the perspective of debugging or maintainability of the code if you just uh, nest like blocks of the SQL code in your uh, in your Spark code. But it's, it's possible. It's just the way the uh, you know, the data is abstracted to developer is thinking about the stream of data as the, uh, you know, incoming messages that, as, that are added as a row to the unbounded table that is just growing as the data is coming. And um, that, you know, that abstractions allow um, Spark basically to allow you to express your logic as well with, for example, Java or Python as well in SQL for the, for the actually streaming jobs for the new real-time data processing. By, by the way, coming back to the terminology, someone may argue that there is no such thing as real-time uh, because there's always some like latency delay, so there's only new real-time. Uh, I, 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 
I like this definition, but as I said, this only terminology does matter that much as long as you make sure that everyone is on the same page. Uh, and okay, um, and uh, another terms we'll be using are sources and things. So in the stream processing, basically where we are getting data from, we are referring as a source. This is like self-explanatory. And where we are sending data, we are uh, referring to the, the naming is streaming sync. For Spark structure streaming, we have built-in sources and built-in things that we can make use of. Uh, and uh, what else? Um, structured streaming. Uh, so uh, just as a side note that if you will like write to multiple sync, like for example, processing the data, writing to Kafka, uh, and apart from that, writing to the console sync for the debugging, each of the write operation is a Spark action and they will this will trigger the separate jo job. So just as a, as a uh, side note that um, debugging can introduce like certain overhead. Um, okay, and what I promised, so coming back to the uh, micro batching versus continuous processing. So this is like important to not, not confuse micro batching with scheduling batch jobs with uh, Apache Spark. Basically uh, in the micro batching, and this is default by in Spark structured streaming that just the way your stream will be processed is that based on time, your uh, messages will be grouped into the micro batches. And default, as we've been saying, it can be like 100 milliseconds latency, but you can also explicitly set time triggers saying like, wait uh, 30 seconds or wait one minute uh, before you start next uh, micro batch and then that that can be beneficial and i will explain why uh, later on but uh, absolutely you know in this in this context uh, micro batching is one of the modes of uh, execution and by the way the default mode of execution of spark structured streaming queries um, Add what I mentioned, we have the triggers. And in, in here we have the visualization, how it works. So in the input, one, what you see in yellow, it's like, we can say it's like a Kafka receiving messages and the log of the messages is growing. So we have received like a first message, second message, third message. Uh, then on the, each trigger interval, it will be uh, like um, the the, processing of the batch of the messages we have received. And in the different output modes, I will not, not go into the details of the output modes, but you can also customize that. You can then be outputting the entire table with the current state or just the uh, messages that changed or rose in our table to use this table abstraction which have changed. Uh, and uh, next, next important concept, and we'll be discussing that in a, like a practical implication, is stateless and stateful processing. So for stateless operation, uh, we can think of that like, you know, each message we are processing is independent from other messages. So if you are like, uh, you can express your logic in Spark structured streaming in, in SQL. So I can use like SQL uh, example where, where country is UK. If you are filtering for the country UK and you get one message, you are checking if country is UK, second message, you are checking that, third message, you are checking that. Um, it's the message you are checking is not in any way related to previous messages. It's either UK or not UK. So you, we are saying that it's processed independently from the previous messages. Stateful processing is the situation where for, for the operations we are performing, we need to have a context. We need to take into account uh, previous messages. An example can be, uh, you know, when you are doing some grouping operations and like the simplest example ever is probably the, the duplication 
of the stream. So yeah, you can you can write like uh, uh, the duplication of the stream, or although you are still receiving like the new messages and how it will be uh, done. So basically, uh, in this in this simple example, let's say that we are the duplicating only on the ID. So we have like ID and the name of the person, and we want we want to get only unique IDs. If we have seen the message already, it can be like um, you know duplication can happen on various levels. Uh, like most of the scenarios, you will not get like exactly once the deliveries guarantees in your pipeline. So even uh, like the the processing in your pipeline can introduce duplicates even if they were not coming in from the sources messages. Uh, so in, in this scenario, we are maintaining state of the, of the list of IDs. State, what we mean by state is basically keeping this list of IDs. When the new ID is coming, we're adding it to the state. And when we, each time when the new ID is coming, we are comparing it to the existing state, existing list and saying, okay, is it unique? Is it not unique? In example here, one, two, three is, uh, has already been seen, is already in our state, is already on the list. So this is uh, like the simplest ever uh, example of the stateful operation for the duplication in the stream. And coming, uh, so so that's it for the like theory and coming to the project I participated in. So, and I will be talking about to you today. So the text stack there was reading messages from Kafka uh, then writing this message or, or um, processing these messages uh, using Spark structure streaming, using PySpark, uh, Python and then writing these messages to the marketing system. The marketing system uh, there uh, was called Tilium. It was used together with Optimizely and it was used to trigger basically marketing communication messages on the website. So I, I'm not, I will not be going into Tilium and, and Optimizely in this speech uh, that, that was not part handled by my team, but if you are interested in, in like the use case, then uh, you can, you can and look up the Tilium and Optimizely. That is something that will uh, allow you to act uh, near real time on the, on the uh, input you provide and then uh, provide based on that some customized feedback to the users. Like it can be pop-up message. It can be some part of the website changing for the user. And uh, the, the requirements we've been given was to read user activity messages from Kafka, process them, send to the Tilium. Uh, and um, the, the, what I was saying, uh, the requirements we, we received was like, okay, let's do it like near real time. There was no specific service level objective, uh, uh, you know, given by any number. It was like, let's do it near real time. Um, we, without maybe at the beginning of the project, much consideration of what are like the boundaries. But uh, basically, you know, the, the case is that uh, you want more or less real time reactions to the user behaviors. So we are getting the stream of events into Kafka. It's uh, consisting of the messages uh, containing some information, what is happening to the user on the website. Let's say user is playing the online casino games and we can say that he is winning, he is losing, uh, he left one game, he switched to the different games. So these are the messages. And uh, in here, the infrastructure, so the Kafka was on Amazon, was Amazon MSK. Uh, Spark, that was the Databricks on AWS infrastructure. So Databricks uh, allow you to buy their, like, let, let, let's call it Spark as a service uh, that can be deployed on AWS, can be deployed on Azure, can be deployed, I think, since last year also on uh, GCP. Uh, in our case, that was uh, Spark. Databricks Spark deployed on AWS infrastructure. And we had some CI CD uh, for deploying Python wheels. So basically, the, the artifact of the packages with the Python code. And uh, 
the question, what end-to-end -end latency is acceptable? We've been trying to answer as a team as we, we've not been given like the specific, uh, specific uh, you know, objective. So uh, we want to display messages relevant to the current user behavior. So for example, if someone is losing many games in the online casino, we want to um, give them some incentive like $1 bonus and uh, basically message them, hey, don't worry, keep playing. Uh, so the, the sooner the better, yeah? If you send it uh, 15 minutes uh, too late, it user can get annoyed and just leave the game. Uh, but uh, also it's not like, I don't know, fraud detection use case where you need to fight for like milliseconds latencies to, to actually um, achieve that. So our initial uh, assumption was that seconds will be probably perfectly okay. And with the micro batching mode of Apache Spark, which can uh, on the Spark part, uh, do it with latencies of hundreds of milliseconds, that was, uh, that was perfectly acceptable. Uh, and uh, first, uh, like uh, moving to the technical uh, side of the lessons learned. Um, first lesson learned was kind of surprise with uh, the cost breakdown. So if you're thinking what are main like expected costs in AWS infrastructure for Spark. So first thing that come in mind is like, okay, you need EC2 machines for Spark nodes. Remember that streaming jobs is like continuous processing. So you will need this EC2 uh, VMs running just all the time. It's not that, uh, uh, you know, like the batch processing that you are uh, doing that. You don't need the cluster anymore. You can decommission cluster after completing the job. This is continuous job that will just uh, continue running. So the, the question here, uh, you know, first, first thing you, you think about is things like the machines, uh, stuff like that. But uh, what we discovered that actually the significant, I, I don't remember exact number, but it was, uh, I think, approaching 20%, something like that. Uh, looking at the bill from AWS, the significant part of the costs of the Databricks running on AWS infrastructure was coming from the requests operating on S3 buckets behind the VFS, behind the file system, more on that uh, shortly. So basically, as, as I put here on the slide on S3, you pay for the requests as well. It's not, you know, that a big uh, number for a single request, but uh, uh, it turns out that if you are running continuous uh, data processing, that it can be, it can amount to the significant uh, portion of your bill for uh, Databricks on AWS. And uh, what is the DBFS? Basically, it's like the equivalent of HDFS, but the Databricks version. And this is used as internal file system. So in this scenario that we are reading messages from the Kafka, then writing these messages to the AWS, uh, to, sorry, sorry, to the API, uh, in this case, the Stellium system. Um, in this scenario, we are not using the um, basically S3 as, um, you know, our source of the data. But uh, still, it's the, the way that um, the state processing, especially because I think that was the biggest problem for the stateful operation is handled, is issuing a lot of this, uh, in particular, list requests related to various operation to the S3. And uh, basically, uh, in, in context of uh, this uh, Spark data processing, we can say that what is recorded, we, 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 we want to record state of progress. And this is the case not only for the stateful operation. So this will be just you know, keeping track how many messages we have already read from the Kafka, what are the current offsets. Uh, and state of data, and this is specific to the stateful operation. And this is, I think, what was the main contributor in our case. So the data which has, be, has to be man, maintained for the stateful operation. And uh, 
basically, uh, Spark is not naive just to uh, have the state in S3 and query it all the time. So it's maintained in the JVM memory of the executors, but you won't fault tolerance that it just apart from being in memory, it needs to be recorded every now and then, and it needs to be uh, like compared to a free version every now and then. And uh, what Spark doesn't offer actually, Spark doesn't offer you like the possibility where you would say, okay, I see that this uh, operation on S3 are generating significant portion of my costs. So what I would like to do is sacrifice some fault tolerant, but without sacrificing latency. Uh, basically, just do it in memory. Don't consult as free what to say, so to say, so frequently. That, that's not possible. So actually, what you will need to do is sacrifice latency to lower the cost if, if the business case uh, allows you. And there is also like the version that you can record the state operation in RogDB key value store. And we actually didn't investigate this version, but on this very issue, we consulted with Databricks. So we had like dedicated Databricks consultant. We've been discussing uh, this uh, problem with, because we've been thinking that maybe this is something with the configuration, maybe our deployment is faulty in a way. And this is why we, we are paying so much for the list request. But the answer from them is that, uh, this is what happens and the recommended solution is was just to think that if we really need this data on such a low latencies, if not to basically introduce trigger uh, every minute, every three minutes that will basically um, allow less of this operations. And that was our solution that we in increased this trigger interval to reduce costs. And that was actually the moment where we had like the practical discussion with business. Do you really need like millisecond or maybe 30 seconds is good for you or maybe one minute is good for you? And, you know, obviously in, in use case as uh, ours is good to do some experimentation. So if we, we, we have some objectives, we want to, uh, for example, offer this bonuses uh, to, the, to the client who is losing many games, losing money in the online casino. And uh, we want to have what is called churn. So losing the clients, we, have, we want to lower the churn. Uh, and it's possible, you know, to design experiments to compare, okay, is there a difference if we do it our, on millisecond latency displaying this pop-up messages or we do it or on 10 second latency or one minute latency. But uh, it's just that, you know, uh, it's, it's good to uh, keep business people involved in these findings, just not to assume, okay, they told us real time, so it's like, 20 milliseconds end of discussion. Um, okay, and another, another thing I will talk to you about that was specific to the Databricks was the auto scaling um, issues we had. So our assumption when we came to the project was like that. Okay, Databricks allow this auto scaling of the cluster. So in here you have the screenshot. If you want to create cluster from the user interface, you tick the checkbox, enable auto scaling. If you are creating cluster for the API, you send the option enable auto scaling. Done. The, the cluster in theory should be able to um, basically adjust the number of nodes to the current workflow. But Turns out that it's not actually meant for the streaming jobs, what we didn't know. So uh, what we observed actually enabling this auto scaling option uh, was that our streaming job was just, our cluster was just oscillating. So it was like the commission, like turning off two nodes just within the minutes turning them back. And that was like going back and forth, back and forth uh, multiple times during the day. So no real saving. So, you know, our, our assumption here for the, for the use case, for the business case was that we have like the big sporting events. We've been handling sporting events and we can have like 
Euros or, or you know, World Cup, Olympics, that during this time we may have much more traffic. And we will basically need to uh, more uh, much much higher throughput to be handled. Um, and this uh, and, and a na naive approach was well that there is this like data bricks auto scaling tick of the checkbox it will do the job for us. It's turning turns out it's not doing the job uh, for the streaming uh, Databricks is stating it's not actually recommended and meant for the streaming jobs. So. Um, if you want uh, to scale up and down your cluster, you will basically need to have some custom logic. So you you have cluster API, and for the stream running streaming job, you can request additional node, but it will not happen automatically on Databricks as we as we initially hoped for. So uh, that's that's another uh, kind of surprise. And uh, moving to, to another uh, subject. So uh, this is a possibility for running multiple streaming jobs on the same uh, cluster. So I think I, I didn't work, uh, for example, with EMR, but I think it's not possible there. Uh, so not every like, uh, Spark deployment will allow you to do that, but actually Databricks allow you to do that. So it's not if you are uh, submitting multiple streaming jobs, it, they can be uh, executed like simultaneously for you on the cluster. And um, another approach would be to have a dedicated cluster per job. And this is approach recommended by Databricks. But you know, what, what we've been thinking is like, Okay, we are like uh, just starting experimenting here. Maybe we don't want already like incur the costs of having each job in the separate cluster. So our uh, thinking like use single cluster or use cluster per job was like, for using single cluster, maybe it will be just you know easier management, and maybe it will be like lower cost than running on the separate clusters, uh, job per cluster. Uh, what are uh, what are you know obvious uh, obvious downsides? So in our scenario, when we actually uh, made any changes to the Spark running Spark job, the deployment involved the restart of the cluster. Just, you know, uploading the new artifacts, new Python wheels, deleting previous one, that actually required cluster restart. Maybe there is some way around it, but we didn't come up, uh, you know, uh, with, with the better solution at my time there. So in our scenario, the, the obvious downside was that basically we needed to, when, whenever we needed to update one job and we have a few of them running on the same cluster, the downtime was affecting all the other uh, running jobs. It was not, uh, you know, long. It was like discussed with business. It was acceptable in our scenario, but still something to, um, Keep in mind, another down, downside was problems with the libraries dependencies in PySpark. So for the PySpark, you will basically install all the Python libraries you need on the cluster. Uh, but then there may be like, you know, uh, if, if the different jobs uh, requires, like, I don't know, for some reason, different version of the same library, uh, there is added complexity to that, or if libraries have dependencies on them, uh, one on another, the, the definitely it adds to the complexity as, as compared to maintaining totally separate environment where each job has just the libraries that are relevant to this particular job. Um, and in here is the question, so how many cluster do you need for the streaming jobs? And Databricks actually uh, something we realized actually something we maybe came to the project without good understanding between this distinction that Databricks offer two types of cluster this 
all-purpose cluster that will allow you to basically run multiple jobs there and the job cluster where you run one specific job and this is perfect especially for the batch jobs where basically you run the job cluster uh, job terminates uh, you decommission the cluster but obviously for the streaming job it's it's not the case so it will be job cluster which is like running continuously and uh, to be able to have this possibility to run multiple jobs on the single cluster, you will need this, uh, what we say, all per all, so-called all-purpose cluster. So uh, this type of cluster, it turns out, is more, more expensive. So here is one uh, answer regarding, okay, is it cheaper? So first of all, uh, by the type of cluster, you will, you will um, pay more. Uh, uh, but it, it has like advantage obvious advantage that you can do type of ad hoc investigations. So let's say something is wrong with your streaming job and you want to do some checks there. And what we had, you know, we had like library installed, we had a TLS encryption authentication set up for communication with the Kafka on the cluster. So if something is wrong, you can investigate on the different cluster, but it's like, you know, a little bit of the guesswork. Uh, are you actually recreating exact scenario where the problem occurred? And uh, what is nice with this all purpose clusters is that you can attach additional notebook and uh, Databricks offers you what, what is like Jupyter notebooks to execute your code. And it's super convenient way to do some, you know, troubleshooting, debugging, especially if you are in the situation that you are starting building something new as we were running first streaming jobs for the company, uh, then, um, Basically, you know, surprises will happen and this type allowing this kind of experimentation and running additional jobs on the single cluster can be beneficial, can be obviously beneficial. And, uh, you know, another thing to keep in mind if you are thinking, okay, so will I make uh, like the savings, money savings running on the one cluster as compared to multiple clusters. So one, one consideration is obviously uh, that uh, basically you will need to buy more expensive type of cluster rent from Databricks. But uh, the other consideration is that to remember that basically generally in Spark, not, not, all, not only in case of streaming job, each application uh, has its own set of executors. So, uh, you know, with obvious benefits that applications are isolated, types tasks from different applications run in different JVMs. Uh, and in Databricks, uh, and this is like, this is not requirement by Spark, but this is the fact of Databricks deployments. What they do, they do only one executor per, per worker node. So if you think about it, anyway, if you are uh, basically running one streaming application, it will has its own worker nodes. So you will anyway not, not make like the great savings uh, here either. So on this pros and cons, I would cross out lower costs. Uh, to be perfectly honest with you, uh, I wasn't there involved in like final financial evaluation. I changed the company. So that was something on the to-do list that was still ongoing to actually have hard numbers to support. But I think the, the lower cost is not, not that great argument. Easier management, well, in the way of enabling like uh, debugging experimentation, uh, especially for the new teams. I really valued this, uh, this possibilities uh, provided by, by this so-called uh, all-purpose cluster. Uh, and cons, yeah, what, what we've been saying. And uh, final, actually, so we are approaching the end of the, of the presentation slowly. So the final consideration, uh, what I've been mentioning that uh, Spark obviously allow you different programming APIs. So you can use Scala, you can use R, you can use Python, you can use SQL to express the logic of your transformation. And uh, you know that Spark has been written in Scala and uh, 
you know, maybe, maybe, um, especially in the days of like RDDs, there was this uh, like uh, um, concept of Scala being the best always and by default. But nowadays, in many cases, with this highly structured APIs, with uh, working with data frames, working with data sets, working with Spark structured streaming, uh, a lot of logic you will be writing, whether in Spark in SQL in Scala will result in Spark uh, optimizer coming up with exactly the same code to be executed and identical performance. So uh, really, I think that Databricks is kind of uh, trying to promote uh, the uh, also PySpark and SQL as being like uh, almost equivalent to writing in, in Scala. Um, and known exception when, when we consider Scala versus Python are UDFs, user defined function, because basically this is like the black box for the Spark uh, optimizer. And this is the same case, like uh, always with the Spark, it, it's not specific to the streaming that basically if you are doing UDFs and you are expecting that you will be doing heavier UDFs than uh, in Python, there will be like additional overhead. It will be starting additional Python processes and uh, this will be significantly slower than uh, doing this UDFs in uh, Scala. But what I wanted to uh, talk about is like specific to streaming. So we've been discussing a basic stateful operation like uh, stream the duplication. But we can encounter also like a little bit more sophisticated stateful operation. And what we learned actually on the project, just doing programming, that something like a little bit more sophisticated uh, function for, for the uh, handling stateful operation, map groups with state is not available in PySpark and to use it will actually need Scala. And uh, maybe, you know, it will be available in PySpark sometime in the future, but I've seen just like recently some talk to Databricks that was, I think, uh, 2016, and they've been saying that it's not available in Python yet. So five years later, it's still not available in Python yet. Maybe we will see it someday, maybe not. But just to consider that uh, taking into account UDFs, uh, taking into account some uh, specific functions that can be super useful for stream processing, for simplifying your logic, it's not always the same. Um, whether you use PySpark or Scala. Just to, to give you context what this map groups with state um, is doing. So it saves, saves arbitrary types of data state and perform arbitrary operation on the state. This is like the specific case of flat map group with states where output mode is update and uh, output size is one row per group. So you can also like relate it to uh, uh, map, flat map uh, operations. Um, we define input data structure, output data structure, state, including some function. And it can be super useful to calculate some custom user metrics. And in our scenario, we've been actually doing it uh, for the user sessions. So you remember I uh, mentioned the player in the playing like casino game. And then uh, we want to, uh, to be able to answer what happened to him in the single session. So if, if he has been using man, losing money, how much he has lost or how much he has win in the single session. We didn't uh, get this session boundaries like within the events we've been receiving, we've been calculating that based on last activity. And then we can say that if uh, like the user has been inactive for 30 minutes with the something like map group with state, we are easily expiring the state. So saying, okay, um, 30 minutes ago or whatever, you know, you think makes sense from the business perspective. One hour ago, he has been inactive for one hour, three hours, uh, 30 minutes, whatever you want to set. Uh, it's not the same session anymore. It's like the 
next session. Uh, so uh, now the problem because okay we we decided okay so this is not available with uh, in the python so what we will do we will not like uh, switch everything and rewrite everything we coded in pyspark to scala uh, apart from that we had other parts of the data platform like uh, you know airflow dags in python uh, people writing lambdas in python so that was kind of language of the choice for the entire data platform. So we'll not uh, just say, okay, so we're abandoning Python uh, going with Scala. But you know, if we decided, as we decided for this one particular use case, make exception and code our logic in Scala, then you remember that we had like the deployments of the Python wheels already automated with the CI CD. So now we need uh, like entirely uh, separate uh, handling for this part of the project that is in Scala. Apart from that, I don't see like main issues with uh, this uh, kind of polyglot approach that you have uh, the streaming project part in one language, part in a different language. There are obviously, you know, different consideration like the language used in the company, language used in the data platform, like availability of the people who know particular language well and have already experienced. So I have no uh, issues with like this uh, distinction. Sometimes we'll use Scala Sometimes we'll use Python, but it will introduce additional complexities. And the final lesson learned is that uh, with the PySpark, Spark SQL getting better and stronger, it's not always the same. And it's like, uh, cannot say it's just, uh, just uh, equivalent. Okay, so uh, with that, that, that's what I had to show you today. And we can move to any questions you may have.